Hello. Today I'll briefly talk about another important uh, subject, which is language and power. Uh, someone asked me a question today about the role of language and power within the colonial spaces during and after colonialism, and I thought I should uh, record a brief lecture about it. Now, language uh, plays a huge role in stabilizing the colonial power structures, and there's a lot of material written about it. Uh, but I'll be only referring to a few good works by some major scholars. Now, the way the colonizers established their hegemony was through their language policies. In most of the colonies in Africa, India, and elsewhere, the colonizers would introduce their educational system, which would be in the language of the colonizers, and the natives were required to force to or encourage to learn the language of the colonizers in order to establish themselves in the, in, in the new emerging societies and polity, but also uh, for their upward mobility. Now, the best book on this topic, on how the language not just creates uh, an aura of power, but also rewrites the native subjectivities, is probably by Ngugi Thiango, Decolonizing the Mind, and I'll post a link to it in the description. In Decolonizing the Mind, Ngugi Thiango gives us three roles of language in a living culture. So the first role, of course, is simply that language is, is a code for understanding the social roles. It introduces us to the mode of production extent in a system, in a society. The second role is as a mode of communication. We use a common language to talk to each other. And the third role is language as a career, or not career, but carrier or container of culture which means that we use language to pass on our past and present to the future generations. Now, when colonialism enacts its policies in cultures which do not have established written scripts, and the culture relies on an oral tradition, it is this third aspect of language that is totally disrupted. Because if you skip one or two generations, chances are people won't be able to pass their histories, their stories to the next generation, and that will be replaced by the colonial education. Now, what a movie talks about the colonial educational system is he gives us the story of a young boy who goes to a colonially administered school, leaves his village and goes to the school. In the school, what he's learning is, let's say, the English language. But in the process of learning the English language, he's also internalizing that this is the language of power. Then in most colonial schools, according to Ngugi, what would be done is in the beginning of the school day, uh, one of the kids in the class will be given a token. And his job was to pass it on to the next kid whom he hears speaking a local language, a native language, which were called dialect. So by the end of the class day, the teacher will ask the students who has the token, and then they will tell him who gave it to him, and they'll have a whole chain. So then all those students who were reported on for having used the native language will be publicly humiliated in front of the class. So not only were these kids learning that English is the language of power and that they need to acquire it to you know, transcend their given lives or to gain upward mobility. But they were also internalizing was that somehow their own language and thus the culture associated with it is inferior. And that is what the language policies do. Now, for the role of English language in India, of course, the magisterial work comes from Bori Vishwanathan, and you can read her book, uh, Masks of uh, Conquest, where she gives us the history of the entire conflict between the Anglicists and the Orientalists, and how Anglicists eventually win, and English is, becomes part of the medium of instruction in India. 
And within that, of course, the most important document is Lord Macaulay's famous speech to the House of Lords, I think, in which he argues that the native Indians should be taught English. Now, part of his argument was that they should be taught English so that they can be incorporated within the hegemonic project of the empire. But he is very clear as to what kind of education he wants for the natives. The kind of education that he wanted, I mean, his words are they should be Indian in blood and English in sentiment. So to produce kind of human subjectivities or human beings who would be able to reproduce materials in English and maybe compute a little bit and thus could be good clerks or good uh, you know, takers of orders, but could not think for themselves. So that's how the colonial education worked in India and Gauri Vishwanathan gives a wonderful account of it. There is another author, Bruce McCulley, whom I cite in my first book, Constructing Pakistan, who also writes about the same topic. But by and large, in India and elsewhere, the role that colonial languages play is not just to be a mode of communication, but in the process of learning the language, the natives also internalize those as superior languages, and hence to them, automatically then, the colonial, colonial culture itself becomes superior. Now, this legacy lives on. I mean, I only have the examples of lived experience in Pakistan, but you can see in Pakistan even now, parents prefer their children to go to English medium schools. Uh, most of the upper, upward mobile, bourgeois, middle class Pakistanis who can speak good English, uh, you will hear them making fun of people who don't speak good English, who don't have a good accent, and there are different terms that are used for them. There is a cultural divide between those who use English as their medium of instruction and probably medium of communication and those who don't. Now, this legacy was given to us through the colonial experience, but we have also perpetuated it within the national space. And you can see that in other colonies as well. Uh, people who have mastered the colonial languages can use them in ease and comfort, also somehow internalize that they are somehow superior to those who cannot. So these are some of the legacies of the colonial language policies and then their implementation in the colonial educational system. So for those of you studying post-colonialism, even though we rely on European languages and European texts, it is important to note that while we do that, just like Ngugi Chango in the Kenyan perspective who works diligently to create, produce, and perpetuate literature in native languages, we also need to work with our colleagues who work on native languages and ensure that not only do they teach native languages and native literatures, but that those are preserved and that we learn collectively not to deride those who may not be good at the colonial languages, who may not speak good English, but who still have great and deeper knowledge of their own cultures and their own cultural artifacts, art and literature. So these are some of my words on this topic. If you um, have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comment section. And if you like what I do on this channel, please feel free to subscribe. Thank you so much and I will see you next time.